Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick Winsness, and I want to welcome everyone to um, this, uh, uh, another webinar in the series of the ICT for D uh, webinar. And we have both Sonia and George, who's going to be both introducing the topic as well as the um, the speakers later on. But before we get started, I want to do a quick little um, housekeeping setup. Uh, we do want to make this as interactive as possible. We do have a lot of um, great panelists here today, and we will give everybody a chance to ask questions. So please land them up in the chat window, and we'll facilitate a Q&A session towards the end of the hour. Uh, we're also um, recording this session today, so please look for a follow-up email uh, with a recording uh, to um, uh, the webinar, and in case we do not get a chance to answer all your questions, uh, we may generate a Q&A document and try to cover the uncovered um, um, uh, questions there. And uh, at the very end of the webinar, you will be presented with a webinar satisfaction poll, and we would uh, encourage you to answer those questions uh, before uh, you shut down your browsers today, so appreciate that. Uh, that will help us improve this webinar series as we move forward. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass this uh, over to um, uh, Sonia and George and um, um, let them uh, finish up or uh, start the webinar. Thank you, Frederick. Yes, so my name is George. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive of the Humanitarian Logistics Association. And we recognize that disaster preparedness and response depends upon effective logistics management. And as a membership organization, HLA acts as a knowledge sharing and advocacy platform to support humanitarian logistics professionals, organizations, communities, and individuals to respond to crises. Digital technologies offer a huge cross-cutting opportunity to amplify and improve the effectiveness of humanitarian logistics. But of course, these technologies are not an end in themselves and need to be integrated into existing programs. So we need to consider issues such as infrastructure and service availability, where possible keeping technology simple and appropriate, planning for sustainability and scalability, and listening to end users to understand their needs and habits, as well as risk factors related to ownership and control of data. So today, the, the webinar will touch on ways to more successfully manage humanitarian supply chains, the challenges of rolling out a purchase-to-pay system, innovations in supporting health supply chains, handling last-mile delivery challenges of ICT for D programs in humanitarian response, and ways that the private and public sectors can better collaborate and exchange information, knowledge, and data to support logistics interventions. So I'm really pleased to, today to introduce our speakers, uh, Sarah Fenneman Morin, who is uh, Deputy Director of Supply Chain Management Performance, Knowledge Management, and Learning at Catholic Relief Services, Neil Rodriguez, who is Director of the Global Supply Chain at uh, IMC, Kim Shelsby, who is Director of Digital Supply Chain Solutions at Comonix International. Eric Kuro, who is the Digital Advisor of Disaster Management at World Vision International. And Shelley Taylor, who is founder and CEO of a startup company called Trellis. So I'm sure you'll find the webinar today extremely interesting and valuable. And following the speaker's presentations, we look forward to answering as many of your questions as we have time for. So over to Sonia to go to the next slide. Thank you. So Sarah, um, maybe you could uh, share with us uh, how ICT can assist a more successful organization-wide supply chain management, and what are your lessons from connecting large ERP systems and mobile-based technologies? Great, thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, we can, Sarah. Thank you. Wonderful. So today I wanted to talk a bit about CRS's goal of having better visibility of our supply chain finance and HR um, processes and transactions, but also to invest in a more collaborative uh, information sharing environment 
wherein everyone involved was speaking with reference to one truth. We found that in terms of cross-functional integration, investing in an ERP system was really the best way to go, both vertically and horizontally, vertically from country program all the way up to the executive office, and horizontally across functions, programming, monitoring and evaluation, etc. But this posed a, a bit of an issue or a conundrum for supply chain in particular, because as we all know, um, supply chain operates in environments beyond uh, the national office of any country program. And in fact, a large part of our operations, both in development and in emergency settings, requires uh, being able to transact in offline environments uh, and in remote locations. In addition to that, supply chain in particular is responsible for coordinating with, uh, with partners and uh, distribution, uh, distribution leads all the way down to the last mile. And so giving access or implementing an ERP system in that environment was unrealistic for us. So we asked ourselves, how can, can we incorporate ICT to really capitalize on all the data that comes at the last mile that we need to make good decisions and have that one truth? So we actually looked in-house because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And we, we knew already that our meal department was a champion of ICT4D. And so uh, we reached out to them and wanted to see if we could use their software, um, the, the software that they had used for their last mile m &E activities. And, um, and in working with them, we found that we could manipulate the software to be used for supply chain purposes. It hadn't been done before, and, uh, but we felt confident that it could happen. And that really brought us to some key lessons learned. Um, the first and foremost is really that you have to involve everyone, but you have to all have a coordinated, and clear agreed upon set of goals and roles and responsibilities. So in this instance, we found that we had to involve horizontally meal programming, finance, supply chain, obviously, um, and our partners and our, our distribution team leads. So, and then vertically, like I said, I mean, everyone from country program distribution team leads all the way up to the executive office, everyone had an important angle to consider. Um, but having that clear agreed upon set of goals was essential to really making sure that our end goal of creating an ICT that integrated with our business system could be accomplished. The second, uh, the second big lesson for us was that integration is a living being. And what I mean by that is um, you can test and avoid, and it might work very well. Uh, but then when you go to talk to your country programs, they'll say, yes, but reality is a little like this for us and a little like that. And so you have to consider what are the core questions or the core elements to integrate? Um, what do you really need to know to achieve that global visibility in order to make a good decision? And lastly, our, our biggest lesson learned was really around um, at all points, we must equally invest in people, process, and technology, all the way down at the country program with a, um, investing in good staff who can manage that integration, also looking at our information flow and making sure that we all agree on what that information flow should look like, 
and um, having a core set of standard operating procedures, policies, and policies, as well as guidance to steer us on uh, what that common truth is. And I think with that, I'm at my five minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. No, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, so Neil, um, maybe you can uh, talk us through uh, some of the challenges uh, that IMC has faced in its global rollout of the purchase to pay systems and how you overcome those challenges. Yes, uh, thanks, George. I hope everyone can hear me. So uh, <clears throat> just very quickly, um, a, a very short introduction to the International Medical Co. Uh, we are a um, global disaster relief and humanitarian aid organization. Our mission focuses very much on, um, on uh, healthcare programming to improve the quality of life for vulnerable people through health intervention, training, and related activities that build self-reliance. We work in some of the toughest locations, but at the same time, you know, we are firm believers in the um, importance of, um, of digitalization and the opportunities that it provides to uh, magnify the impact of our, of, of our work. So about myself very quickly, I've um, also got a um, significant background in large ERP implementations in both the private sector and uh, for the past seven years or so in the in the aid sector as well, in organizations like Merlin and Save the Children before IMC. Um, I've, I've uh, seen, seen the sector really come along most um, promisingly and encouragingly, particularly in the past three to four years. So when I, when I first started out, there was really not much um, awareness and penetration of, of ERP software and, and systems in the sector for supply chain management in, in particular. We had aid matrix fighting a kind of a loan battle along with uh, with Helios but now if you look at the picture today there are so many so many much more um, uh, options available and and uh, the softwares that are being customized to work uh, with the um, operational and, and programming context of, of our sector so to cut the um, anyway to cut the long story short for IMC uh, you know we we did a, a survey or, or a kind of a uh, strategization of uh, what are the best um, or, the, or the key benefits that 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 we could um, uh, generate through our investments in LMIS, uh, which is Logistics Management Information Systems, and uh, we decided to prioritize two areas. One was uh, or one is our uh, pay-to-pay uh, purchase-to-pay system, which is known as also known as P2P, in short, um, along with uh, stock management modules of that system. And one of the reasons for doing that was because it, it's um, a, a software which is easily in, integratable into our our financial modules. So so we have the the benefits of uh, of linking up um, our, our uh, these these different um, functions uh, into a common ERP. So so we are doing it in a bit of a step by step manner. The the other one that we decided to prioritize was our <clears throat> was the last mile demand planning systems or uh, HIS, Health Information Systems. Uh, so the opportunities that these two softwares have opened up for IMC is firstly, much better demand planning by connecting our last mile beneficiaries and users, uh, for example, at the, at, at the clinic level um, and obtaining real time data on, on the consumption of medical commodities and supplies at these locations, which then helps drive much better inventory management decision making and and reordering as well as helping us to optimize our inventory levels and and we have been successful in in doing this in in some of the most uh, challenging locations uh, in 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 the middle east for example we have also had um, or beginning to see a lot of benefits uh, from uh, from deploying the purchase to pay system in terms of being able to have better spend uh, spend data on, on our global global spending, which is driving in turn uh, uh, an increased ability to um, deploy category management, which helps us to extract a lot more value for money from our for, from our global spending. This also helps us um, on, on on the practical side with our programs to perform better demand forecasting, collaborative planning with our with our vendors and suppliers, 
uh, which is leading to much shorter supply lead times. So we have seen uh, that we've been able to reduce our supply lead times from three to four months in, in some locations down to two weeks, even when we're supplying places like Somalia and the uh, Central African Republic, which as, as some of you know, or most of you know, are, are very hard to get supplies into. Uh, the final uh, key benefit that I want to quickly stress is the ability to, um, to drive performance management through automation of KPIs, which is uh, a, a key uh, goal that we have to move towards uh, being being a more professionalized uh, supply chain uh, service organization. Now, among some of the challenges that we have faced, or, or rather that I have seen in the sector over the years with, um, with deploying uh, these kinds of uh, IT solutions, which are so important, the first one is uh, uh, still there's a bit of a lack of mature off-the-shelf off the uh, software, which is, uh, which is contextualized to our sector with its heavy compliance uh, burden that we have, as well as our uh, other bespoke business processes as well. Um, so this is something which, you know, in the private sector, I think has pretty much been solved. They are very, very easy to use off the, off the shelf solutions, uh, but still for us, we still seem to be having to invest a lot of time in, um, in, in uh, co-developing these systems with uh, whichever software providers we decide to work with, or we have to build them in-house, which is again, not very efficient. The second one, which is again, I think a bit of a unique uh, sectoral challenge is um, our ability to underestimate the complexity, costs and resources needed for global uh, ERP software deployments. There's a kind of a humanitarian bravado, I guess, which, which, which goes along with, uh, with the territory uh, in thinking that, uh, you know, we can wing our way through these uh, complex uh, software deployments and then we you know, run, run into the inevitable realities, which is that you can't do some of these things on a shoestring uh, project management practice when it comes to ERP deployments is, is quite a well-established uh, you know, uh, science with, with a lot of hard facts. And if you try to take too many shortcuts, you end up um, you know, having, having serious challenges in your deployments. And the final one, which, which I think really needs to be worked on and understood better by the sector is the importance of, of really understanding and deploying serious change management practices. So uh, I think some of my colleagues have touched upon and will touch upon the, the uh, challenges of, of, um, of rolling out these kinds of softwares in, in, uh, in some quite remote and, and um, underdeveloped uh, locations, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the, the, the um, obvious difficulties in, in trying to get people to change age-old behaviors that they've been used to. Uh, so, so, so not taking that seriously, I think, is, a, is, a, uh, you know, is setting yourself up to having a lot of challenges down the line when, uh, when, when these softwares and, and solutions are deployed. So I'll stop there. I think I've, I've um, hit my five-minute uh, barrier as well. But, uh, you know, as I said, I think the, the, um, the direction that the sector is moving in and the interest that we are seeing even in in this uh, webinar is is proof of the um, tremendous positivity that we, we that we should have uh, about uh, about the opportunities that digitalization can bring to all of us. That's great, Neil. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I very much agree with you there. Uh, so, Kim, uh, over to you next in terms of. Uh, you sharing some of the uh, experiences you have with digital innovations in supporting health supply chains, and especially tracking of medical suppliers across various regions and through different partners. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. First, I wanted to reiterate what Sarah talked about in terms of coordination. That is that one way to make it easy to work with different partners is to standardize the objectives, the reporting requirements, the data models, et cetera. This makes it much easier to work with partners um, and to innovate. So we're seeing innovations happening all along the supply chain that are leading to better delivery of products and services. So I'll talk about those, the different categories of innovations, and then I'll leave trace and track um, for last so that I can put more emphasis on that. So starting at the beginning of the supply chain, we're seeing lots of innovations in forecasting and supply planning tools. So we have things like um, stock out early warning systems that are helping us 
in really complex supply chains to be able to look months in advance and anticipate where stockouts are going to happen if we don't take action. Um, we're also seeing real improvements in inventory and warehouse management that are reducing the need to build more warehouses. And we're using the existing warehouses in whole new ways. Um, so we have new distribution models that are really helping to make the supply chains more effective. The next thing I would talk about is the improved transportation management. So once again, we're seeing by having improved models and, and better information, we're able to reduce the need to buy more vehicles. You know, the, the answer to improving a supply chain isn't always to buy more assets, whether it's vehicles or warehouses. Um, and we're also demonstrating the opportunity for more outsourcing. So the next area that I talk about would be um, temperature monitoring. So we're assuring product safety, both while the products are in storage as well as in transit, so that we can ensure that we're keeping uh, medicines safe. We work in a, in a wide variety of supply chains, but medicines is probably the, the largest of the supply chains that we work in. Um, another innovative area is electronic proof of delivery. So we are implementing an ERP system here at Comonix, and we're also implementing electronic proof of delivery um, applications that will literally eliminate hundreds of thousands of paper forms. So we're really excited about this. Another area that we're innovating is in the use of drones. So we can use drones for time-sensitive commodities where the road transportation is really difficult. Um, and there are also opportunities which we're just starting to look at now to use drones for doing uh, inventory counts in our large warehouses or our regional distribution centers. The next category that I would look at would be data management. And, and this is a huge question. You could, we could spend the whole webinar just talking about um, data management, but um, there are lots of challenges here in terms of the scale that we're working on. Some of the challenges are that um, our data is siloed by project or program, by health area, by funder, by country, in-country MIS systems, uh, the tools that we're using. There's lots of siloed data. So what we're working on is really how to use all of the data that we have to be able to present it and represent it um, much more effectively. So the last thing that I'll talk about is trace and track because that uh, was your question specifically. So we have a whole range of trace and track solutions, everything from very high-end control towers to inexpensive GPS tracking devices that can move with or, or inside of a, a shipment to provide regular updates. But I think that uh, where I see a lot of our emphasis in trace and track is really on standards. So it's implementing GS1 standards, GTINs, et cetera. Uh, my colleague Sam O oh, um, did a blog recently on driving interoperability through common language. And what this does is, is look at, again, all of the ways that we are standardizing information and data flows to make it much easier to keep an eye on um, the commodities as they move through our supply chains. So the point that I want to make here is that we're seeing innovations all along the supply chain, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about where we are with our supply chains. Um, I've been looking at and working in supply chains for a long time now, and we are making lots of progress very quickly. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Kim. That was great. Um, Eric, um, you're next, and uh, you are going to share with us, uh, I hope, some practical tips for more effective humanitarian response, particularly uh, particularly for dealing with last month's delivery challenges of ICD programs. Thank you so much, uh, George. I will start off by reiterating a point that uh, uh, I think as we mentioned, uh, the technology in itself uh, is not really the biggest challenge in last mile delivery. Uh, as my fellow panelists have talked about, uh, there are solutions, there are systems, uh, whether are ERPs or other proper solutions, that is in place. Uh, technology is often the easier bit. Uh, I think for me, key issues that 
caused the majority of challenges, uh, particularly at the last mile delivery, uh, include culture, people, and process. Uh, I was glad that uh, Sarah talked about some of that stuff and, and need to invest in those kind of things. Uh, and yet, unfortunately, these are the areas that we ignore uh, and we wonder why digital technology uh, doesn't work very well at the last mile. Uh, so just to specifically answer the, the question, uh, here are for me some practical tips uh, from my experience in World Vision. Um, I think one, don't forget about foundational infrastructure. While access to connectivity and electrical power has improved in most of the context where we're operating, this is not necessarily the case. So just because connectivity and power might be accessible in Kampala does not necessarily mean that that's the case in Arua or in a refugee settlement. Um, we could have the best strategies and the best technology, but without basic infrastructure being in place, we will not succeed. Uh, and so I think it's for us to plan for this, not make that assumption uh, and ensure that we develop some contingencies. Uh, but also I think what's helpful is that we should also be advocating for foundational infrastructure for the communities that we serve. If they are connected uh, and if they have access to power, uh, it's actually much easier for us uh, for last month delivery, uh, particularly if you think about stuff like digital and cash are converging uh, in that sense. Uh, second tip for me, I think it's we need to focus on digital literacy of humanitarian and development staff, but most importantly, of the communities that we serve. We like to define digital literacy a bit more broadly. Uh, so there's an element of IT skills in terms of being able to undertake a Skype call or send an email uh, or search the internet, uh, but also there is data literacy. Um, how we can best utilize data, but also data privacy and protection. Uh, and for us, I think there's a, a third component of uh, digital literacy in our definition, which is understanding the impact of digital technology on our business models and our processes. Uh, and so a few things I think for us to think of. Uh, I think one is let's ensure that our, our staff, particularly at the front lines, have the necessary IT skills to deploy and maintain the solutions for last mile delivery. Um, and oftentimes, I think uh, at the front lines, there is limited IT support. Uh, and so the more our staff are empowered, uh, the easier it becomes for us. Uh, number two, uh, we need to raise awareness uh, about data privacy and protection and the potential for our staff at the front lines uh, to make populations that are already vulnerable more vulnerable in how we mishandle their data. Uh, and I think another thing is uh, for us, I think, to be able to have open minds to research and learn about how digital technology is disrupting our industry uh, and our business models and how we can be able to position ourselves to survive and thrive, uh, particularly when we think about the convergence of cash and, uh, and digital. Um, you know, one of our successes, I think, uh, with the last mile mobile solution, uh, we think is particularly tied to digital literacy. Uh, of not only our staff, uh, but also uh, increasingly that of our communities. Uh, I thought tip, uh, George uh, and uh, people listening, uh, I think it's to keep it simple, and George, I think in some ways you, in your opening statement, you mentioned that, uh, especially keeping it simple at the last mile. Uh, so we could have very complex systems, as Neil mentioned, an ERP system, but I think at the front lines, uh, we should try to keep it as simple as possible. Let's make it functional, uh, let's ensure that it's fit, fit, fitted to the context. Um, and sometimes it means that it might not necessarily be the latest technology, uh, but what's functional for that context and actually works. Uh, my take is that if there are too many parts that need to connect together, it's unlikely to work. If we have to fly in a specialist to be able to undertake some basic maintenance, maintenance it's not going to be sustainable. Uh, we should be asking ourselves, why are we collecting all these different data fields? Um, so what's good enough? Uh, and so those are some of the things that uh, could help us to keep it simple uh, and ensure that we're more successful uh, in the last mile. Uh, and the last point I have uh, is about investing in the ecosystem. Uh, my colleagues talked about collaboration. I think it's quite important. Uh, and what I really hope for is investing in a digital ecosystem, not just at a global level or regional level, but primarily locally. Uh, let's have a bias for collaboration with other actors, including local actors. Uh, let's develop solutions that are interoperable as much as possible. 
let's standardize uh, where possible. Instead of developing new solutions, why not build on existing solutions that are in the market? It's much easier to support and maintain them uh, because there's a community around those solutions. Um, I think, for instance, uh, as an example, last my mobile solution, um, it's a really good example of uh, a solution that has been adopted by multiple actors uh, covering digital registration and activity tracking. Uh, and uh, it really helps uh, when there's some sort of standardization or even on solutions. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you, Eric. That was great. And um, yeah, very much concur with your, your points around uh, the need for working on digital literacy. So our final speaker, Shelley Taylor. Uh, hi, Shelley. Um, I'd like you to uh, share with us how humanitarian actors, private and public sector, can better collaborate and exchange information to support more effective logistical assistance. Hi, great. Um, nice to speak to you all today. And I found a yes, um, many talks really interesting. Just because the challenge is a private company, and we've been working with the NGO and public sector for the last three years. Our history with these actors uh, started with when we launched an app, which is called the RefAid app or the Refugee Aid app, in 2015 or beginning of 2016. And we had a technology platform at the time that created mobile apps that had all kinds of real-time data um, capacities and geolocation and things like that. And when I saw the refugees coming into Europe, I thought, here's a group of people who have their phones, nothing else. Let's give them access to the services that they need right on their phone. And so I talked to some organizations like the UNHCR and the Red Cross and said, is this something you'd be interested in using this platform to push all of your services out into this mobile app so people can find what's closest to them? And I thought at the time that we were solving the problem of making the information available to the refugees or the end users. But what I realized after waiting for a few weeks to get the first data in from one of these major NGOs is that they didn't have it in a database and they had to call each office and ask each of the offices to give them a list that they then put into an Excel spreadsheet in order to be able to give us uh, that information to do a bulk import to populate our content management system so it could publish it out to the app. And for someone in the private sector, that was quite um, a surprise. And I realized at that time the problem that we actually had to solve was helping the NGO and nonprofit and government sector do a better job of mapping the resources that they had, the services that they had. So over the last three years, um, this app, RefAid, has spread to 23 countries with no effort on our part whatsoever because I think the pain point was so great and there was such a need for, on the one hand, for the organizations to be able to see what they had in their own organization. So if you were, for example, Catholic Relief Services or if you were um, Caritas in Italy or anywhere, you might have many offices that were offering services and the offices might even be close together. So just getting visibility within an office or across the same organization was critical. But then coordination means knowing that we're not duplicating services uh, through several organizations in the same place and same time. So that was the problem that we ended up sol solving. And I think the fact that it's growing by itself is just evidence of the need for this kind of collaboration. The tools that are included in that platform are things like being able to send geotargeted information to people in a particular area about some time-sensitive time information. There's all this access, obviously, to the real-time data. Some of the challenges that we've seen, however, is that these organizations who have services, and you could talk about services or people, volunteers or supplies, I think they're they're very similar, that they operate in silos. And um, so there isn't a, an attitude of sharing across organizations, even though there may be within an organization. Uh, there's a challenge we've faced with the use of technology in the field. We provide um, all of this information to the actors on their mobile phone and on a website, but people are used to 
for example, I was just hearing about Cox Bazaar, that one organization sends one of its team to a meeting that another organization is handing and it's, uh, is having. And it's a very analog, you know, brick and mortar way of getting information, but there's no centralized data point. We've also seen the challenge of just getting some organizations to even be willing to have a database, a centralized database, which might be surprising to some of the larger organizations, but we found it doesn't really depend on the size of the organization, how, um, how much has been made available in a centralized database. And then the last challenge that we've seen in this is that once we've got to this level where there's now at least 23 countries and most of the major organizations who have services for refugees, maybe 5,000 of these organizations, then there's a breakdown in them even telling the end user that this information is available. Now, in some places like Cox Bazaar, the refugees don't have access to phones, or most of them don't. But in many of the places where the NGOs are serving the population, they do have access to mobile phones. And so we're trying to figure out where is that kind of uh, problem coming from? Is it a cultural um, thing that um, organizations are used to having people come to their tent or to their, their office or to their reception area to get information, and they're not used to thinking in terms of disintermediation, taking themselves out of the middle like we've seen in e-commerce over the last 20 years. Is this a cultural challenge? So what we, I think is needed is a central source of truth. I've heard, I think it was Sarah who was speaking about that earlier, um, that there's too many stuff separate software uh, solutions. Um, and if that's going to continue, I don't think it should be that all of these software solutions are built uh, from scratch by each of the organizations themselves. So that means we need interoperability. We need to have organizations creating APIs that allow their data to be exported and used in a multiple uh, platforms. Um, and I think that it was very um, interesting to hear what uh, Kim was talking about in terms of the, uh, the need for um, standardization of data. And I think that's something that we have to move towards in the future. So I think my five minutes are up. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shelley. No, that was, that was great. That was very interesting. Um, so, I'm now going to maybe hand over to Sonia. Um, are you going to help me with uh, reading out some of the questions, or would you like me to handle that? I uh, think thank you very much, George, and thank you to all the speakers and also Shelley for the great um, uh, summary as well, referring to the other contributions. Um, we received a, a, a lot of questions, so um, I'm not going to through through these questions, but in the meantime, please feel free to still um, uh, post your questions in the chat room, and if we don't get through all of them, we will um, make them available to the speakers afterwards. Um, my que first question is for Kim. Um, Kim, this question is, uh, you mentioned new distribution models. Um, if you could please give an example um, for a new distribution model and also how much resistance to use of drones uh, sorry, to use of drones you have found from NGOs or like what le lessons learned, um, if there are any. Okay, thank you for the question. So first with regard to new distribution models, I'd say the first thing is we're trying to eliminate across the organization the use of the word warehouse because warehouses are where commodities go to, to sit. and what we reinforce is the use of the term distribution center because it's all about moving the commodities efficiently. So uh, in some countries, we're managing not just a warehouse, but a whole network of warehouses or a whole network of distribution centers. So we're working to sort of optimize those networks so that we reduce costs and we're able to pre-position products uh, more effectively. So some of the techniques specifically are using cross-docking or bypassing the central medical store so that when a shipment clears customs, rather than going into you know, a national level warehouse, we're taking it directly to a local or a, a state level distribution center. So that reduces um, handling costs. Um, there's lots of benefits to it. So lots of things that we're doing to improve 
uh, distribution. On the question of drones, I'm really not aware myself of any resistance that we've seen from NGOs on the use of drones. I think um, some of the, uh, the, not the challenges, but in getting drone programs going, there's lots of, of uh, collaboration and stakeholder involvement in terms of getting um, donors, national governments, sort of um, everyone to understand the benefits of drones and then how to proceed um, with actually implementing drone programs. So my colleague Scott Dubin is our expert on this and for anyone who wants information um, on our drone programs, I'd be happy to connect you with Scott. Thank, thank you very much, Kim. Um, my next question is about um, standardization. Um, how far is standardization possible with so many actors and stakeholders in the humanitarian sector? Um, I know, Sarah, we are obviously working on standardization within CRS, but do you also have uh, maybe some comments on um, how uh, CRS is working with other actors and um, maybe have some uh, answer to this question? Sure. So we, um, within CRS, uh, standardization uh, is something that we're trying to tackle from with the recognition that there are some things that have to be decentralized. There are some decisions that have to be made um, in a decentralized way. Uh, but the question we asked ourselves first and this was also this was true in our relationship within the function of supply chain uh, between supply chain and programming and then also for partners was around what is meant to be decentralized and what um, what being decentralized um, just creates more work so um, you would want to standardize things like uh, your forms and um, your standard processes uh, along the supply chain, kind of given best practices. But you would want to allow um, key programmatic decisions to remain uh, um, non-standardized, but with guidance. Um, and of course, you if you can if you can standardize the systems you use, that means that you get to share information at every level and across departments. Um, we did collaborate with our programming department to create a combined um, reference point that looked at standard, um, kind of the standard life cycle of, um, of a project and look at when do you need to involve partners for different processes? When do you need to involve supply chain for different processes, uh, finance? meal, so on and so forth, so that um, so that there's flexibility in your objectives, but that you all have this common reference point to say, this is, uh, these are the actors with whom I should be working at this step, um, inside and outside of the organization, and these are the tools that we have available to us, and the system where we're documenting for each of these given steps. So we took a holistic approach around standardization. Um, and we are in the process, um, as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of a living thing in a system and even just among people, that idea of integration and standardization is a living thing and we're in the process of um, rolling that out in partnership with programming. Thanks. Can I jump in there? This is Shelley. Yes, please. Just a very quick comment on what um, Sarah was just saying about standardization and decentralized um, decentralization. And I just wanted to add my private sector two cents worth here. And I think that um, I've already said that I think there's a challenge with all of the NGOs, the larger ones at least, building their own things and clearly their own software. Clearly, the interoperability is really important. But I also think an example that makes that more clear is when you think about the internet, which is which is primarily run by the private sector, and it's a centralized, decentralized platform. And I think that if we focused um, the actors, the primary actors, the NGOs in particular, focused on um, thinking in terms of a, a 
single central tool uh, for integration of various types of data and then focused on their end having dashboards so that they could pull this data into whatever format they wanted that we would see a lot of money being saved in terms of software development, but also we would see um, standardization that has worked really well in terms of the way the internet works. And I didn't mention it before, but um, we did create a platform a copy of, not a copy, but a, a much broader platform, which is called LifeSpots, that is looking to be that single centralized source, of, decentralized um, source of truth, we may not be in the end the one who succeeds at that, but it seems like it's quite necessary to have a, a one-stop kind of platform where all the APIs can feed into and then um, output into dashboards rather than building of huge software platforms. And I, I, I agree with that, and I do think it's um, there's a balance there. Uh, CRS has, com, uh, has com participated in a community of practice with other uh, large humanitarian aid organizations looking at what are some key KPIs that we could all report on um, in, a, in, a, in an anonymous way or in a way that um, allows you to have the things that are, um, you know, your privy information still within your own control. But having those common KPIs that um, can tell you about the health of an industry, uh, I think having one global standardized system is a little harder when you have a mix of, of donor expectations, of context, et cetera, um, government expectations. But I think talking in terms of shared data is a really good approach uh, to the future access and visibility of our work. Thank, thank you very okay. much. And, and thank you, um, Shelley, that already answers one of the other questions. Um, sorry, did I just had another comment from? Yeah, this is uh, Eric. Um, I, I wanted particularly to answer the question with regard to, uh, you know, how do we standardize under so many actors and stakeholders mm -hmm. in the human trans sector? Uh, and I think sometimes that we could feel that it's very complex and, and time consuming, but I think oftentimes that we just don't talk. We don't talk to uh, a department within an organization to see what they're doing. We don't talk to uh, a partner NGO or a local actor uh, to figure out what's working for them. Uh, so I think this idea that uh, we, we should just have that conversation to see what's working and, and can we, uh, you know, can, can we go move forward. But also I think having a bias for action. Sometimes I think we want to have everybody around the table. Uh, and that could become quite complex and uh, there is inaction. But I think to basically say, well, if two or three organizations are ready uh, to get started, how then do we continue building a coalition uh, going forward? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, George, do you have anything to add, given that is obviously a focus for the Humanitarian Logistics Association? Um, no, thanks, Sonia. I, I mean, I very much concur with what's been discussed uh, so far. Um, and particularly uh, Shirley's point around the importance of interoperability, um, I think that there is a need to, to be able to um, find that, that single source of, of truth, that, that, that ability to um, share knowledge and information, which is what one of the things that we're trying to do through the Humanitarian Logistics Association. Um, and. Uh, Hopefully, in our series of, of webinars that we we have to run this uh, this year, uh, we'll we'll get uh, get some more answers around this. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a difficult situation, but I think it's a, an improving situation nonetheless with regard to uh, a growing realization that there's um, uh, a need to uh, to share information on on uh, technologies and digital technologies, particularly between different organisations. Um, you know, I think uh, with with funding and uh, difficulties in in financing um, projects now becoming more difficult um, and more more challenging, and donors rather being more um, uh, themselves uh, applying more scrutiny. I think that there you know, they need to be finding ways to be more efficient. Excellent. Thank, thank you, George. Uh, Neil, I also have a, a question for you. Um, 
So the uh, start of the comments, uh, find the electronic proof of delivery very interesting as it might serve as a means to reduce diversion of humanitarian relief materials in corrupt countries. So do you think this is a correct assumption? What are your um, experiences? Yes, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the entire um, digital supply chain, so, um, you know, even even technologies like like the blockchain have uh, have have significant uh, potential for um, you know for for reducing the um, this huge problem that we have of um, of shrinkage in our supply chains when we are delivering to the last mile in 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 several countries. So there are there are definitely lots of uh, you know good good technologies out there right from uh, RFID RFID solutions to um, Secure um, tags, barcoding even is is not yet well well established in the sector surprisingly, um, and then you know finally yeah the the, um, the blockchain uh, based solutions, which um, are already beginning to show to show um, um, evidence of uh, reducing uh, these kinds of losses in 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 the supply chain. But uh, at the same time, I think it's it's quite a nascent uh, field. Uh, you know, and and a lot more um, probably research um, needs needs to be done uh, before we can uh, conclude that you know these these uh, solutions are uh, easy to 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 deploy. Uh, what we are what we are uh, you know I think currently focusing on is uh, is also um, um, digitalizing uh, data as as a means of um, of uh, reducing uh, paperwork as well as uh, chances of of committing fraud, and uh, you know one of the points that, that Sarah mentioned about um, leveraging what M&E departments are doing is is also something that we are seeing as an as an opportunity in that area. So I think uh, you know we, we we should look um, broader as well within our own own sector to see what solutions might already be existing. Uh, but yeah, there's you know definitely a, a lot of potential uh, in this area. Excellent. Thank Thank you very much, Neil. Um, one last question um, is quite specific, so um, this is for um, uh, all speakers. Please uh, uh, kind of raise your hand or rather voice if you have an answer. Um, it says uh, one of the audience members says they would be interested to hear if the panel has experience in applying ICT solutions to improve water tracking operations specifically. Is there anyone in the group that has some experience? On water tracking operations. Okay. Okay. All right. Maybe. Yeah. Otherwise, maybe something we follow up. Um, always good to get some ideas for future um, <laughs> for future content. Um, um, I could just briefly say uh, sorry, sorry on that one. Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to. Um, a point that uh, I think Kim mentioned with regard to the importance of uh, managing transport. I mean, water is is a a, a commodity that that's uh, frequently trucked, and so it comes back to being able to to uh, manage trucking operations of transport or fleet operations more effectively. Thank you very much, George. Um, so this is my last. Last question, any other um, final comments um, or anyone would like to add to the to the discussion as we're running into our last five minutes? George, would you like to say a few last comments before we move on? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sonia. I mean, I, th I think it's been a very, um, very interesting uh, session and uh, thanks to all of the uh, the panelists for their reflections um, and we we you know we look forward to being able to uh, share this uh, webinar more widely with uh, with other colleagues through the recording um, I think that uh, what I my my reflection really is that uh, knowledge is key to the future success of of humanitarian logistics services and particularly knowledge, knowledge digital knowledge. Um, and digital literacy, back to uh, Eric's uh, point. Um, so uh, in, in, if there was a call to action that I would have, it is 
to uh, gain uh, the support of, of the uh, participants in the, uh, the webinar today to um, support the, the Humanitarian Logistics Association, as it, you know, it would be very, very valuable to, to get your um, oh, well, I would I would rather to to uh, encourage you to join our association, um, either as an individual or as an organisation, if you're not already a member. Um, so please go to our website, which is uh, up in the in the chat. Um, and I'd just like to thank everybody for for joining today, and particularly thanks to CRS, to you, to Sonia, particularly for helping to uh, put this together, and to the. Uh, Net Hope Solutions Center for hosting the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, George, and thank you for all our uh, speakers and um, sharing your expertise. Um, so we will uh, send the recording and um, some notes afterwards. And thank you very much for, to Net Hope for helping facilitate uh, this webinar. We will. Um, reconvene in for the next ICT4D webinar um, on March 12th. It's going to be on responsible data. And um, also, I like to take this moment to highlight that uh, this year's ICT4D conference, which will already be the 11th conference, um, end of April, April 30th to May 3rd in Kampala, Uganda. For the first time, we have a conference track specifically looking at supply chain. Um, so this should be interesting to, to this group as well. And um, then we're, we're pretty much right on time. I think, Frederick, you still have a few comments uh, around um, a, a survey. And um, that yeah, leads me to thank everyone. And hopefully, we'll hear you or see you again in a month's time at our next ICT4D webinar. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Sarah and uh, uh, Sonia and George. Uh, this has been super interesting, and hopefully it'll spur a lot of further discussions, um, uh, both uh, in the upcoming webinars as well as uh, at the ICT4D conference in Kampala in, in April May. I also want to thank all the speakers for insightful comments. Uh, this has been uh, uh, very useful. Please look for a follow-up email. We will send that out uh, later on today with uh, links to all the content and the recording. And also, please uh, take a minute or two to answer the questions in the uh, webinar satisfaction poll that will pop up in your uh, browser as soon as you leave the, the webinar today. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, we will see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Frederick. I've just actually remembered we had an ICT at scale webinar last year that had very similar um, conversations. So I will post this as well if, um, if there's more interest. I think that will also be useful information. Thank you. Thank you.